Hi everyone. In this video we're going to talk about linear functions and basically this is a function that when you graph it it looks like a line. We'll talk specifically about the slope or average rate of change of those functions. And so a linear function has this format. So we have our function f of x and it equals to mx plus b. Okay, where m, the letter m, represents the slope or rate at which the line is changing, the points on the line. So our slope m is here, times by our input x, and then plus b. b is going to give us, if you were to graph this, the y-intercept, where your graph touches the y-axis. So the y-intercept would be zero for x, and then the number, whatever b is, and that's where you'll hit the y-axis. So if you have your function, maybe it looks something like this, so it is a line. Then you have right here your y-intercept, so b would be zero, because you're hitting the y-axis at zero. And then your rate of change, or m, is your slope, and that's telling you the steepness of your line or your function. So the rate at which you're rising and running across this line. Okay, so that's a format for our linear functions and we have what's called slope intercept form. So we use f of x for function notation, but a lot of times you might see this as y. So if you see y equals mx plus b, that's called slope intercept form. So our slope intercept form of the equation of a line is just this form here. So same thing that we wrote for our linear function modeling uh, equation, and this is just letting you know if you have this equation, you can tell really quickly that this number in front of x represents the slope, and then this number back here represents the y-intercept. So that's why that's called the slope-intercept form of the line. So a lot of real-life situations can be modeled using linear functions. Before we get into some examples, let's talk more specifically about the slope and our slope formula, so how you can find the slope if you don't have it already, if you don't know what the number m is, it's basically the rate of change um, between two points, or if you think about rising and running as you travel on the graph of the function, but more specifically, the formula for this would be that you take your inputs and outputs and you see like how far apart they are. So let me explain what that means. So you're seeing how things are changing. So if you have one x value and you're going to have a second x value, we want to know how far apart those are, their distance. So you could say x1 minus x2 or vice versa. More, to, more so you see this as the second x minus the first one. So we would say x2 minus x1. So the difference or distance between the two x values and then very similarly, their y values, how far apart are they? So the distance between f of x2 and f of x1. So I'm using my function notation instead of y, but you may have learned this in the past or this might seem more familiar or easier to remember. You could say y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's basically, what is the change in the y values? So another way to write it is the change in the y values. This is a, a, it looks like a triangle, it's Greek letter delta, it means change or the change in. Um, so the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values. So how far apart are you moving on your function vertically divided by how far are you moving horizontally. So that's the idea of slope. Then when it comes to average rate of change, it's essentially just equal to these same things. So your average rate of change is just equal to your slope between two points. So we could copy this same formula right here. Okay, now let's take a look at an example. And so we have this one here. A 100 gallon tank full of water is being drained at a rate of 5 gallons per minute. Step one, we're going to write a formula for a linear function that models the number of gallons of water in the tank after x minutes. Um, so we're going to be writing our function in this format up here. Okay, so something to mention, when it comes to linear functions, the slope or average rate of change is constant. If you think about visually a line, 
it's the same rate of change throughout the whole line. So if the line looks like this, it's constantly doing the same thing, rising and running at the same exact rate for the entire line. So for any uh, linear function, this is not true for other types of functions uh, necessarily, but for linear functions, it is a constant slope or average rate of change. And then the other thing to mention as we try to solve part eight of this question is that this y-intercept um, represents in a real life situation like this, it represents an initial value. Okay, so it represents like a starting point. If you think about if it was a y-intercept, it would be because it's when your input x is zero, because if your y-intercept is here, that's when x is zero, and so you're on the y-axis at zero comma, whatever this number is, and then your function goes through that point. Um, but if there's nothing negative over here, like let's say x represents time, well, we're really not interested in anything negative over here. So this would be an initial value right here. Okay, so let's keep those two things in mind as we work on the first part of this problem. So write a formula for a linear function that models the number of gallons. Okay, so we know that our minutes is going to be x. So if it helps, we can go ahead and just say that this is minutes, but we're going to use x. Okay, and so this is equal to mx plus b. So our m, our m that we're looking for is going to be some constant rate of change. So we're looking for the some constant number some constant number that it represents the rate at which this is changing, rate of change. Okay, so reading the sentence again, we have a 100 gallon tank full of water. It's being drained at a rate of five gallons per minute. Okay, so five is the rate at which it's being drained, but also the fact that it's being drained, that's important because the water is decreasing Okay, if you think about it, the water's going down. So this is a negative slope or negative rate of change. So our M value, or our rate of change is negative because the water's decreasing. So functions that are decreasing have a negative slope. And then let's just mention it here for future reference. If a function is increasing, then it has a positive slope. So that says increasing. If it's increasing, it has a positive slope. The other possibility that we, do, and we do come across this, is that if a function is constant, if you think about that one, so don't get this confused with a constant rate of change. If the function itself is a constant function, then it's only going horizontally. It's not going up or down. It's not rising or running. So in that case, the slope of something constant staying the same would have to be zero because it's not rising or running. Okay, so just things to keep in mind um, regarding linear functions. Okay, so we have those things. We figured out m, so we know m is negative five. And then now we need b, the y-intercept or initial value. So reading back at our problem, a 100 gallon tank is full of water. So initially it's full of 100 gallons. So that means that this is going to be plus our initial value of 100. So we're gonna say plus 100. So that's our B value right over here. Okay, so our function, our answer to part A, our function model would be f of x equals to negative five x plus 100. And the negative five times x is because notice it says per minute. So that means times x. Remember x represents minutes. So our rate of change times minutes or times x. Okay, so that's part A. So next let's take a look at part B. It says how much water is in the tank after four minutes. So remember that minutes is being represented by x. So this says when x equals to four, how much water is in the tank, so how much water. If you think back of our formula that we came up with our linear function, we were writing a linear function for the number of gallons of water in the tank. 
after x minutes. So what we had here was for some input of minutes, this is the output of number of gallons of water. So our, our y value, our f of x value, is number of gallons of water in the tank. Okay. So now we know that for part B, how much water is in the tank means if x equals to 4, what is, the, or the question is, what is f of 4? Okay, so we just have to plug in 4 and see what we get. So plugging 4 into our function for minutes for x, we get negative 5 times 4 plus 100, and so we get negative 20 plus 100, so that's 80. So our answer to part B is 80 gallons of water are in the tank after four minutes. And then notice that this does make sense that it is less than 100 because the tank is being drained. So it's being drained at a rate of five gallons a minute. And after four minutes, we went from 100 to 80 gallons. All right, so for the last part, the question says, use the x and y intercepts to graph the function and then interpret what they mean essentially. So our x and y intercepts, let's talk a little bit about those. So for any graph, if you are looking for the x intercept, when does the graph hit the x axis? The way that you do that every time is you let y or um, f of x equal to zero. So you're saying when the output is zero, what was x? So you let y equal zero and then you find x. Okay, you find the input. And then very much the same, but in the opposite manner, we have y-intercepts are when you let x equal to zero, when the input is zero, what's the output? So let x equal to zero, and then you find f of x or find y. So those are your x and y-intercepts, and that's where your graph touches the x and y axis. So uh, something like this, this would be an x-intercept because we're touching the x-axis, and this would be a y-intercept because we're touching the y-axis. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure that out for this question. We'll start with the x-intercept. So we're gonna let y equal to zero. So looking back at our function, f of x is y. So we're basically saying, if I put a y equal to zero here, if I say zero equals my function, what's the x number that makes that happen? Okay, and so Another way we talk about this is to say, um, what is the zero of the function? So we're using the term x-intercept, but sometimes this is called the zero of the function. Uh, find the zero. So that means you let y equal to zero and you find out what x makes that happen. Okay, so let's do a little bit of arithmetic here. We're gonna subtract 100 from both sides, and then we just need to divide by negative five. So we have negative 100, equals negative 5x, and then if we divide both sides by negative 5, then the right side we get x, and on the left side we're going to get 20. So 20 on the left equals x, and so now we have to interpret this. So as a point, let's go ahead and take a look at the graph and then interpret it. So if we were to plot this point, it is an x-intercept, and so we know if this is like zero, then we can say maybe 20 is over here. And we got that 20 for x gave us a zero for y. So the x-intercept is 20 comma zero. Um, before we interpret it, let's find the y-intercept and we'll talk about each one. Okay, so for the y-intercept, we're gonna let x equal to zero. So for that one, we're just gonna put a zero right in this spot, right in for x. So we'll put a zero in that spot, which means it takes the place of x right here. And so that one is going to look like f of zero, and then that equals to negative five times zero plus 100. And so that's just negative five times zero, which is zero, plus 100 equals 100. Okay, so the y-intercept is going to be 100 for y when x was 0. So that one, let's just say that that's like right here. So if this is 100, then that's the point 0, 100. 
and this is a linear function, it's constantly going down at a rate of negative 5, so it would go down from here, negative 5 um, per minute, negative 5 gallons per minute, all the way down to here. So that's the graph of the function. And then interpreting the intercepts, well, we already actually know that the y-intercept, the y-intercept represents the initial value. So 0, 100 represents what we started with. So this is the initial value or initial water, to be more specific, the initial water in the tank. And then what does the x-intercept represent? Well, think about what's happening here. We're touching the x-axis when x is 20. x represents minutes, so this says something about 20 minutes. And then think about the point. We have 20 comma 0 because this is a y value of 0. So it's basically saying after 20 minutes, the y value or um, gallons of water in the tank, it's 0. So after 20 minutes, the tank is empty. The tank has been drained completely. Okay, let's take a look at another example here. So in this one we have that in 2011, online sales on Thanksgiving Day were 479 million, and then in 2016 these sales were uh, basically 1 billion, 287 million. So part A, find the average rate of change in sales in millions. So the average rate of change is just the slope between the points, and we only actually have two points. So I'm gonna say average rate of change is going to be the difference in the y's divided by the difference in the x. So for us, our formula was f of x2 minus f of x1. That's the difference in the y values, or outputs, divided by the difference in the inputs, so x2 minus x1. We only have two pieces of information given, so we work with those two. Um, however, if you were given more data points or data values, you would just choose two. Okay, so we're told in the time of 2011, in that year, that the amount of sales in millions was 479 million. Okay, so the input is the year 2011, the output is the money in millions. So that would be like our our first point, x1, y1. And then we also know that in 2016, that the cells were in also terms of millions, 1,287 million. So that would be a second data point, so x2 and y2. And now we plug those into our formula for slope or average rate of change where f of x1 and f of x2 is our y values. So we have that in the later year, the um, cells was 1,287 minus the first data point where the cells was 479, so that's our outputs or y values, divided by the inputs or time, this uh, case is the years, so 2016 minus 2011, and then we just simplify. And this would be the slope between those points, or in other words, the average rate of change. So if you simplify this, you get approximately or 161, um, but it's 161.6. So about 162 is the answer here. And the average rate of change, so this is actually um, millions, because that's what we were working with. That was our units. And so basically what this is saying is that the the rate of change of the cells, um, online cells on Thanksgiving Day, go up about 100 increase, because it's positive, increase 162 million on average um, during this time frame. So secondly, we're going to graph these cells and then interpret the average rate of change. Okay, so we have the two data points. We know that in the first year that we have information for, which was 2011, I'm not going to put this at, at, um, at zero, 00 because we don't know. There might be other data. Um, we just don't have it. So we'll just say 2011 is about right here 
and the cells in terms of millions was 479 so I'll kind of do something like this I'll say like 400 and then this over here is in millions so millions million dollars and then over here this is in years and so we'll say um, five years later about let's put it here 2016 we went all the way up to 1287 million so that would be a lot higher we could say like this is 1300 million and so our data points might look something like this like 2011 we're about right there and 2016 we're about right here and now uh, we don't know exactly if every year the rate of change was um, about 162 million but what we've calculated here what this represents is on average so on average over the course of these years each year the rate of change or the amount of cells went up about 162 million per year so we could say up 162 million per one year up 162 million per one year and so on so that's what we've calculated on average how did it change um, what, whether or not it actually did this it, it might have did something more like this like some years it went higher and some years it went lower but that was the average all right the last thing to mention is just a couple of lines that you might come across that are a little bit different so one is if your function just equals a constant value so let's just say it equals C well this is okay and this does occur but this would be uh, just a horizontal line so you'll have just a horizontal line if your function f of x just equals a number and that's because you just have your y value or output at that number the whole time so let's say this is c you can put a value there like five and no matter what your input is your output is that number so that is a horizontal line this is the equation of that kind of line and in this case the slope if you notice you're not rising at all if you're walking across this line if you're traveling on this you would just be running you wouldn't be rising at all so the slope in this case is zero and that's for a horizontal line the other possibility is if you have a vertical line and in that case you actually have that x is equal to a number so x is equal to a number gives you a vertical line and if you visualize that you would be stuck or stationary at a certain x value but you'd be going up and down in the y direction so if x is this value c like let's say it's three you can go up and down anywhere in your coordinate system you're just not moving left and right so in that case if you're traveling on this one you're only going up or down but you're not running at all and so your rise is changing but your run is not and so in that case um, you wouldn't actually get a number for your slope because it's technically like dividing by zero so you're going up or down but not running left or right so you're dividing by zero so the slope would be undefined so if you have a vertical line the equation is x equals to some number like x equals to c and the slope in that case is undefined all right so that's it for this one Thank you for watching.